Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 342. I'm your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com. We're honored to have with us the nationally acclaimed and celebrated <laughs> author of Hawaii Calls and the Red Wheelbarrow, Marjorie Matthews. Thank you. That's the best intro ever. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Barney. You're welcome. And so b- before we before we start recording, I was mentioning that you know, this is your second book from Rootstock Publishing. Right. And and I missed getting you on the show when your first book came out, Hawaii Calls. And um, and, and so that I, I had to make sure when I saw that your name came back out again for your newest book, which is going to be released officially April 18th. Its pub date is March 26th, but my launch event at the Norwich Bookstore will be on the April eighteenth. Yeah. Yes. So. so I'm I'm one of the I'm one of the uh, the the lucky few that got this to get the advanced reader copy for it as well. So, and and so as I said, this is your second novel that that you published through Rootstock. Um, do you want to give people a little bit of background on how you got into writing novels? Yeah, sure. And and um, this will be basically a huge plug for Joni Cole. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> she she get, has gotten many people in the Upper Valley um, started in their, their writing um, adventures. And actually, I, I can't say that she started me. I, I, I think the first writing group I was in would, was back in 1976. At, um, I was teaching at a community college in Hawaii and um, shared space with English faculty and was invited to join some other English faculty to uh, in a poetry group. And so I think basically until 2006, the only kind of writing groups I'd been part of were um, related to poetry. Mm. Um, I'd done writing professionally, but, but I'd never done fiction. I'd just done nonfiction. And um, so somebody said, I, I was interested in the idea of writing a novel and, and somebody said, well, Joni Cole's the place to start. And so I started with back in 2006, it was in her living room and, <laughs> um, that's, she taught me so much and, and the people, other people in the workshops have, have instructed me as well, but an awful lot of it is just the doing it, you know, and figuring out what's working and what doesn't work, um, but it, it, I started with, actually, the first novel I started is The Red Wheelbarrow, but I couldn't okay. find a structure for that one. And um, then I came into possession of these scrapbooks of my grandmother's and realized that I had a mass of material about Hawaii back in the 1930s and 40s because she was the gossip columnist for the no, uh, local paper back in Honolulu. And... Oh, wow. uh, and so I had, she had recorded all this information about the nightlife and what was going on in Hawaii then. And I had a wonderful narrative arc in her story. So I ended up putting Red Wheelbarrow aside and writing Hawaii Calls. And then uh, it really was um, in COVID, Joni Cole and I started exchanging work, our writing and, and touching base each week. And um, so I started playing with some structural ideas for the red wheelbarrow and with her encouragement and uh, another dear friend, uh, Hawaii friend, Lonnie Leary, um, the two of them convinced me to stick with this project. And, uh, and I'm so grateful because I truly, um, this is, this book is the book from my heart. Um, Mm. and so this means a lot to me that it's seen the light of day. Um, and, and I learned a lot with Hawaii Calls about publishing and working with Rootstock. And it's um, just been a dream working with Samantha Colber. Um, right. She's just amazing. So I'm I'm very happy to be at this point. <laughs> and, and, and so the Red Wheelbarrow, it's about it's it's about love. It's about family. It's about creativity. It's about um, a woman from Hawaii. It's about a man from Vermont. There seems to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot going on. And. It actually, when, when I first showed up at that first workshop with Joni, 
um, I didn't know anything. She, she says, just write a scene and see what, what comes out. And two things I was intrigued by. I read, um, I think it was around 2008 that Olive Kittredge, Elizabeth Strout's amazing book came out. And although I think it's easy to remember it as a novel, it was actually a series of link stories and had the, that had the same character. And I was really interested in how minimally she could do the narrative structure that she could still, just by creating this amazing character, um, pull you in completely. So I was intrigued by that. And then I was personally just intrigued by my own life experience that despite the fact that terrible things happen to all of us, that we all have terrible, great challenges that come along, um, there still have been so many moments in my life where there was this sense that something intervened, that some, I would call it a benevolent presence, a benevolent force, a force for good. And mm -hmm better things than I could imagine would come to be. And that sense of inevitability sometimes that this is meant to be, not all the time. And, and I do think we you know, have free will, we can choose to notice, discern, or we can choose to ignore, um, but it's something I'm very grateful for. And um, so I wanted to play with that idea of, of are people brought into our lives when we need them? Um, is there some intention about around the people and the events that we need? And so I, I played with this idea of having these two characters who start off being in totally different parts of the world and they meet as children. And, um, and then over the course of 40 years, they're going about their lives, but they keep crossing paths. There's a sense of inevitability, even though they're not really connecting and getting to know one another um, and so hopefully uh, what I wanted to create was a book that made a reader feel like, okay, <laughs> these people are going to find their way here. And, um, and then as I wrote it, I didn't see the themes developing. It took other readers to show me or, or respond to help me see what themes were coming out. But I realized that I was also looking at how the decisions people make making, have, mm. living with integrity, trying to, you know, aspiring at least to do good, to do the right thing. And um, I think especially in the character of Paul, I had fun creating a, a really positive character. My Hawaii Calls was a difficult book and it's a difficult story and and it wasn't a lot of fun. And in writing Red Wheelbarrow when I was pulling the pieces together, it was COVID, it was the chaos of, of the end of the Trump and all that going on. <laughs> and it was just a comfort to write about a benevolent force in the universe and people trying to be good and live, live de decent lives. And then, and then the power of a creative outlet to give us meaning and direction in our lives. And that, that for, for Paul, he, um, I just felt, I, he, I have to say he's inspired by my husband as a, in the sense of how my husband's a very quiet, but very good man. And, um, but I had such fun in, in his joy of art, giving, creating this character who loved, wanted to be a painter, but was a farmer. And there was nothing about his life that suggested this is something he should pursue. And then, and then my character, Amy is, is married to a narcissistic, poet professor um, who kind of makes sure that she doesn't pursue or, or realize her own potential. And, um, and I have to say that storyline is not my storyline at all. Although there's a lot in her, her life that I borrow from my life. Um, so for her, it's the poetry and that's when they both have gone through difficulties. It's the art, the mm. creative outlet that helps them find their way back to who they are and at their best. So um, that's why I'd say it's from my heart. It's, it's, it's some truths that I think have been there for me. And, um, and I'm glad it's, there's nothing better than hearing that people like it, that people find it 
appealing um, Mm. because I hope it makes people feel good. And so this is a historical piece. This is, does this, this doesn't take place in the modern day. It takes place in the. It starts the the current time is 2000, 2000 to 2001. And then I have a a narrative. It's just a one year narrative of the now, but then it alternates with um, scenes from the past in each of their lives. And so that you're getting snapshots of, of how they got to be the people they are in 2000. Mm. And that's because I, when I started writing it, 2000 wasn't that long ago. <laughs> and, and now it's, it's, it's the whole 20 some years. <laughs> but it does cover a full 40 years of time in their lives. They meet at, as children and then they meet again at the end as adult, you know, middle-aged people. Right. So did you have the characters first or did you have a storyline that you wanted to tell and then you just kind of like develop the characters around the story you wanted to tell? I did it. I really did it scene by scene. I just started with Joni's okay. technique and just saw where I was going and kind of discovered them as I was writing it. And certainly that there's no secret that that Amy has had some things happen in her life that happened in my life. Um, she works for a U.S. senator who I work for, <laughs> you know, there's, and I shouldn't say that because it's, it's very loosely, most of it is very loosely based, but, um, but mostly I just started writing some scenes and, and mm. the easiest to start with are moments, start with moments that were resonant for me, something that, um, but not, but it isn't a plot driven book really it's not um you know a page turner of what's going to happen but but some things are are pretty awful that happen and and they're things that usually the things that are awful are things that i've i've witnessed either happening to loved ones friends family or something that's happened to me um but the character of paul did require me to stretch because it was a male character and a farmer in Vermont, <laughs> and no, but I had nothing to draw on from my own. Um, so I, I'm glad that that character seems to work for people. I've gotten some really nice reviews on Goodreads, and that's heartwarming. Um, it's especially when they're people who don't know you and they're still saying nice <laughs> things. <laughs> so, how did you research the role to write for? I well, I think just living here long enough, you know, that having some sense of, of how life works here. And, and I, I didn't go deep into the farming. I mean, there's, Mm -hmm. it's not, nobody's going to pick this up and go, Oh, well now I really know the nitty gritty of farming in Vermont. (laughs) Um, Because these are more scenes from everyday life. So it's um, yeah, I, I, there were, were plenty of times, you know, I thank goodness for the internet because I don't know how writers used to do this, that, there, it's it's wonderful. I you know I I do remember looking up you know what is the university what does UVM offer in terms of extension courses for farmers and um, doing I'd have questions and and that, but I could pretty quickly research them um, and then I I tried to make sure I had some readers who had grown up in Vermont and had some at least some familiarity um, but I tried not to go anywhere where I didn't know what I was on rough, you know, shaky ground and not pretend that I was going to um, provide some insight into things I didn't know enough about to write on. As you were writing this, did you, did you know how the book was going to end or did you, did it just kind of flow and you were actually kind of following the no, story I didn't yourself? Know. And, and well? I didn't, I had, I knew that one character was going to have to make a major decision and um I guess because I don't think of life as being neat. It doesn't tie mm. up in little ribbons, you know, and I'm okay with ambiguity and I don't mind movies and books that leave you kind of, I wonder how that's going to go. But I had a, a absolutely fantastic developmental editor who had copy edited what he calls Marisa um, Keller. I can't say enough good things about Marisa. And uh, she she read, read Will Barrow before I submitted it. I, I handed it to her to get her input. And, and she said, the decision has to be made. <laughs> you have to let us know what the decision is. Um, so she pushed me to, 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 and I, and that was good. I, and I, and she was absolutely right. Um, but um, 
I didn't know. Um, mm. I, I, that's the fun. That's what's so great about it. I, it's just right. the best part of writing. I know there are people who really, you know, map it out. Um, I've I've heard Jody B. Cole talk about how she outlines really, really in detail, and that just amazes me because you know it's it's a different way of the brain working, and and I and no wonder somebody can create the stuff she does in the in the and um, and it, if you have that kind of a mind, but for mm-hmm. me it was discovering these people, discovering their story, um, and I love that. It's right. the same thing with poetry. You don't. I never know where I, you know what I'm going to go to, and the best stuff is the stuff I haven't ever articulated. It's it's like your brain is speaking to you, that subconscious that brings something up, and um, it really is true joy that when you're right. in that space. So, in a way, because you're telling Paul and Amy's story, did the book end? You don't have to give the end anyway, but did did the book go? Did it end the way that you thought it was going to end then? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think I think I knew um, that um, or that I would at least leave a door open for a, a this ending to be one of the possibilities. But but it is much clearer now, I think. I think there's still some. Um, yeah. Again, I, I do like things to be. There's a direction and and reason always giving reason for hope, but, um, I don't, life is just too mixed to me. (laughs) You know, it's not one big picnic or one, one misery. It's, it's this, and it's just so full of surprises. Um, right. No, it's, does this, do you put, do you with this book, because you have uh, Amy from Hawaii, Mm -hmm. do you, uh, pay any um, homage to your first book because it took place in Hawaii? Um, only in the sense that there's same similar locations. I do, a lot of it is the past is, well, even the present because Amy goes right. home a lot, her family's there. And, and, a, and, and a lot of her dilemma is, has to do with location and where she will live. And um, so, yes, there's a lot about Hawaii in this book too. Um and more modern day Hawaii. Um, right. And and some of the, I don't know if, if anybody's, I, I love the film, The Descendants with uh, George Clooney. And it, because I thought it was, a, it was an effective, the rare effective portrayal of a certain part of Hawaii. Hawaii is, you know, there's so many images of Hawaii that are out there. Um, but it, that one dealt with the dilemma of, families who have big pieces of land through inheritance um, and what is the responsible way to deal with that um, mm. as, as you go forward in time. And because to sell it leads to development or can lead to development. How do you preserve these, these big areas that haven't been developed? And it's not terribly different from the, the issues of farmers in Vermont who have big pieces of land and what do you do with that land and can you continue to farm? And um, so that is a theme that comes up because both characters have those question marks of what is the future for this property of the family. Right. Um, so yeah, Hawaii is very much a, a presence in this book, not as singularly as in Hawaii Calls, but it's definitely in it. Some people mention also the idea of there's um, a take on just cultural identity as well mm-hmm. within the book. Uh, do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? I don't think I, I will share this particular scene, but there is a scene where Amy is explaining to somebody back in Hawaii why she lives in New Hampshire. You know, why would you? And, and I get that question a lot. Why are you here? Why aren't you in Hawaii? And and it's a, um, it is a tug of cultural identity because I have, I really have, a love and respect for particularly, I think Vermont, um, mm-hmm. that the, the decency, the, the town based culture, the, the way, the tolerance, the, just the no fuss quality. Um, so there, I, I think that keeps me grounded here and, and because I really like the lifestyle here and Honolulu is, 
spectacularly beautiful. All of Hawaii is beautiful. They're, it's a rich multicultural place, which is wonderful. Um, and I'm so grateful I grew up there, but um, Hawaii today is so not what Hawaii was when I was a kid. It's just, mm. um, and especially Honolulu. And I, um, so I, I have mixed feeling. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I, I was able to have, I will just give one, something away that Paul manages to get to Hawaii himself <laughs> at some point and, uh, and to see that through his eyes and, uh, um, and the differences of, of somebody who's grown up in a small town in Vermont versus living in Hon a big city like Honolulu. So that comes in. It's not a huge part of it, but yeah, it's definitely there. Right. So you wrote from the, the the perspective of a Vermont farmer visiting Hawaii. yeah he was wow. a he's a teenager when he goes but um and in that okay. case he's he's living on a military base um with family um which is another big part of what Hawaii especially with the island of Oahu is is so heavily military um right. so it was fun to be able to include a little bit of that world too um but to see the perspective of somebody from Vermont who was working in a store. I have him working in a store owned by a Japanese family. And yeah. so um, mixed for some, some cross-cultural things. Um, <laughs> yeah. And did you, Marge, did you want to uh, read a section? From uh, well, book? would you like me to? Cause I, th I thought I might read the prologue when the two characters sure. meet. That, yeah, um, absolutely. It's so this is set. This particular passage is, um, from 1960, so okay. he Paul is nine and she's seven, and they're we're at his family's farm. It's um, and it's in this fictional town called Lisbon, Vermont, that's just across the river from from New Hampshire. <laughs> um, and so I'll just it's about a five minute read. Okay. Okay. Bet you never had a wheelbarrow ride before. Paul jumped up from where he sat cross-legged on the grass beside Amy Barnes. His family's corn, hay, and pumpkin fields lay spread out before them, and across the Connecticut River, the green hills of New Hampshire were softening into the blush of fall. He headed for the barn before Amy could answer. The Barneses, visiting from Hawaii, were staying with friends nearby. Paul's parents had, off had offered them a glimpse of Vermont farm life. And because he and, Army and Amy were somewhat close in age, he nine and she seven, Paul had been saddled with showing her around. He sensed Amy's hesitation, but kept going, half hoping she wouldn't follow. He grabbed the wheelbarrow's handles and rested the braces on the ground. Go ahead, climb in, I'll hold it steady. It's dirty and the paint's chipping off. Paul brushed out the debris. There. Amy still seemed unsure. You scared or something? No. Then get in. Red paint chips flaked off in her hands as she grabbed the sides. Not too fast, Paul Rideau, his mother called from out front of the house where the others had gathered. Paul started out slowly. Once they rounded the far end of the barn and were beyond the adult's view, he began to trot rocking the barrow gently so that Amy yelped and leaned back for better balance. Turning the cart onto a cornfield stripped of its crop, he headed down a soft dirt furrow, the dry corn stalks flashing past. Put out your arms and fly, he told her, increasing his speed, his legs churning, kicking up dirt. Army, Amy hesitated, then lifted her arms into wings. She laughed and leaned her head back, sunlight warm on her face. It does feel like flying. He rounded the rose end and pushed the wheelbarrow down the field toward the pond. From the marsh reeds curved around the water's edge rose a massive cloud of butterflies, gilded by the late afternoon light. Paul slowed and stopped, still grasping the handles as the mass hovered over the reeds. He wanted to reach out his hands, feel the flicker of those tissue-thin wings. 
Amy looked back at him, her cheeks bright red. I think that's the best thing I ever saw. When the butterflies settled again, Paul helped Amy climb out, and they walked back side by side, Paul pushing the wheelbarrow. Something had shifted. He felt comfortable with her now, almost sorry he wouldn't see her again. He propped the wheelbarrow against the barn. Amy reached into her jacket pocket and pulled out a broken seashell. I found this on the beach where we're staying in East Haven. My mom says it's the heart of a shell. I once saw the ocean from a pier in Boston, but I've never walked on a beach. Just like I've never been in a wheelbarrow or seen a million butterflies all at once. She spoke so softly he had to lean close. A shell's not as good as being at the beach, but you can keep it as the next best thing. Amy set the shell in his hand. Maybe someday you'll come to Hawaii, and I can show you how to ride a wave. Paul nodded, though he couldn't imagine ever going to a place so far away. He slipped the shell in his pocket. As they rounded the barn's corner, the western sky opened before them. Huge cloud tendrils streaked neon pink across the sky. Amy stopped, head back, her eyes raised. Paul was surprised. He thought he was the only one who noticed when colors lit up the sky. And then that starts the entire book. Yeah. So, and, and I will say it's been interesting. I thought I'd get more comment on it and so far there hasn't been, but it's very much based on the, the other, you know, inspiration was, um, the William Carlos Williams poem, um, a red, the red, I, a, the red wheelbarrow and mm -hmm. the line of, um, so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow, um, mm. is, was part of, you know, churning in my head when I was, was working with this and, uh, um, yeah. I'm a big fan of his, his work. Well, so, so Marjorie, so if people want to, check out this book if they want to purchase it where's the, or where's the best place they could go to well i always encourage people to try to support their local indie bookstores so um any bookstore can get it for you um you can order from rootstock on their website but it's also on amazon and uh i i know from experience well i don't know i think books i i know norwich bookstore is able to get it early and before the pub date so that I can do, can sign copies. And I will say if people order from the Norwich bookstore in Norwich, Vermont, um, they will. And if you say you, what you, that you want it signed or you want a message, um, I will, I'm going to go in and sign those books. So, um, you won't get it maybe as fast as getting it from some other sources, but it will come signed. So that's another option. Um, and that's the Norwich bookstore. Perfect. Needless to say, right. big fan of the Norwich bookstore there. Another one of those bookstore. wonderful places. You know, Vermont is amazing. I, yeah. um, that's a big difference between Hawaii and Vermont. There are not a lot of bookstores in Hawaii um, and certainly not the kind that we have here. And um, just the support for the for writers. I mean, the Norwich bookstores does two or three events a week. It's amazing. Right. Um and and that's I know that's true in Montpelier and, and other communities as well. We're just really really lucky. And um, no, notice I say we as if I'm a Vermonter, but you know I can practically see Vermont from my in my front yard, so it's only a mile away. Well, I mean, you wrote a book about a Vermont farmer, so I mean, you're an honorary Vermonter. Oh, now, okay, so good, like, good. Yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> Happily wear that banner, that identity. Yeah. Well, perfect. So Marjorie, when you get your other book, your next book, so you, you seem to be writing a book every couple of years now. No, so. I'm, I'm done. I think um, what I'd like to do is is get back to doing some poetry. I haven't done poetry. I was very privileged to be with a group of amazing poets for many years. We had a collection of our poems out and they've got a new one out The the, the group would not with, I, I stepped out when I started writing the novels. Um, and I've missed that. And so, and, mm. and because I include Amy's poetry, oddly enough, is my poetry from when I was first starting out. Um, 
and well, some of it, you know, I guess I did write all of it, some of it more recently um, for her childhood ones, but um, I would like to go back to that because that satisfies in a different way. Right. Yeah. It's well, perfect. Good. When you when you get your poetry book, you got to come back. On okay. That. See. Yeah. See? yeah. <laughs> I might know are. somebody who who likes to re to publish poetry books too. <laughs> yeah, Samantha's you might know somebody. The perfect person. <laughs> yeah. We'll see if she yeah. has very high standards, and uh, yeah. I I'm not as confident about my poetry, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> see, see where I go next. Yeah. Well, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Marjorie, for coming. Oh, it's been a pleasure. I've, I've had so much fun talking to oh. you. And so with this is like, could you, you kind of had some stories with, were you, did you decide, all right, let me, edit, let me uh, timestamp this for a second. So then I remember when, where's my pen, Marjorie? I just had it. <laughs> I, I really didn't move it. I didn't. Okay. Here it, oh, I found okay. it. Here we go. I knew, I knew it was someplace around here.